Theistic Evolution Critiqued, the Old Testament, Part 2. We've been talking about the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. And uh, it is dealing with the question of how does God relate to the universe. Uh, in, in particular, uh, how the universe came to be. One can go with uh, what we can call young life creationism. One can go with what used to be called old earth creationism, but is more precisely de defined as old life creationism, because it's the life that really counts. Uh, one can go with something that's more gradual, but still has God involved, and you can tell. And that would be ID-friendly theistic evolution. Uh, one can go with a theistic evolution that's not friendly to intelligent design. That is to say, God may or may not have intervened, but if he did, you can't tell. And finally, there's the one that says that God didn't intervene because there is no God. Um, and that's atheistic evolution. This book is not aimed at atheistic evolution precisely. It is aimed primarily at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. Atheistic evolution will take its lumps, but they are side effect lumps, so to speak. Uh, they're collateral damage. This chapter was written by John Currid, and it's in section three, the biblical and theological critique of theistic evolution, and it's entitled, Theistic Evolution is Incompatible with the Teachings of the Old Testament. And uh, it starts out with this uh, epigram, there is nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9. The summary of the chapter uh, reads, this chapter explores ways in which theistic evolution is com incompatible with the teachings of the Old Testament. It closely examines Genesis 1 through 3 and responds to the five most common alternative explanations proposed by advocates of theistic evolution. Uh, number one, the fun functional model of Genesis 1 through 3, two, the view that Genesis 1 through 3 is myth, the view that Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood as figurative and theological literature uh, for the sequential scheme interpretation in which argues that the events of Genesis 2 uh, occurred long after Genesis 1 and 5 the etiology as methodology interpretation which claims that Genesis 1 through 3 was written not as factual history but as an explanation for certain features that we see in the world though the explanation need not record actual historical events Multiple features in the text of Genesis 1 through 3 show these alternative explanations to be unpersuasive. That's what uh, John Currid is going to argue. Um, he starts out with the story of uh, Dr. James Woodrow in, 19, in pardon me, 1884 and shows that that is similar to what we have today. And then he talks about Peter Enns and John Walton uh, John Walton will figure prominently because he is one of the more prominent scholars. Um, but there's another reason, which uh, we'll mention shortly. And then it comes to the functional model, which uh, uh, in Genesis 1 through 3 is myth. Those are the same five we had before. Figurative and theological literature, the sequential scheme, and etiology is methodology. And discusses the functional model, which we did last week and discusses Genesis 1 through 3 as myth. Um, uh, and then we are now at figurative and theological literature. So we will begin there. One of the most common and popular ways, ways to deal with the issue of the origins in Genesis 1 through 3 is to argue that the account is figurative. In other words, it is not the biblical author's intention to present his material in a historical and scientific manner. His aim is really theological, that is, the account exalts the Lord as the creator of the universe, but the writer is not interested in the manner of creation. Uh, Dennis Alexander exhibits that, and I won't bore you with some of the details, which you can kind of fill out in for yourself, or you can read the book. 
Um, Francis Collins also classifies uh, Genesis 1 through 3 as poetry and allegory and therefore not intended to be understood as factually true historical narrative. Um, I find it fascinating that Francis Collins can uh, uh, write that uh, given that his training, as far as I know, is clearly uh, uh, scientific and not historical or theological. Uh, but because he's a big, a great scientist, why people tend to believe that everything he writes on is true, which is kind of a little bit on the weird side, if you think about it. Now, John Walton, on the other hand, does have theological training. He is the third author to adopt this figurative literature approach, although his descriptive label is archetypal literature. By archetype, he means a kind of everyman allegorical story in which what happens to Adam and Eve is a kind of allegory, an archetype to tell us what happens to every person. Skip over a little bit of Scott McKnight as well. The end result is the same. Genesis 1 through 3 should not be understood as historical narrative reporting actual events that happened in the past, but instead we should understand these chapters as figurative or allegorical or archetype, archetypal or literary literature, which I'm not seeing the difference between those and myth, really. Um, it's the, the, you know, there's two questions. I mean, there's only one question after that. Did the author believe what he was writing? Um, my objections here will apply to all four of these approaches because my contention is that Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood as historical narrative. Um, Alexander supplies a number of examples to demonstrate why Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood figuratively and theologically, but not historically or scientifically. For instance, he states the following. For myself, I have never met a Christian who, upon reading Genesis 3, 8, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, imagines that God was physically walking around in the garden with two legs. Um, no Hebrew reading this would have imagined that the God of Israel, of whom no form was seen when he spoke out of the fire, Deuteronomy 4.15, was clattering round the garden in noisy footwear. In reality, this is a rather vivid and heart-aching picture of the results of sin. Well, that's actually the Hebrew reader would have no trouble understanding that what was being described in this incident is a theophany, that is, a temporary appearance of God in physical form. At times, the Lord even takes on a theophanic form as a human being. In Genesis 18, 1 through 2, for example, the text tells us that Yahweh appeared before Abraham at the tenth door when three men stand before the patriarch. And most of you remember that story. Again, uh, Alexander says, these chapters represent the opening manifesto of the Bible, setting its parameters and its priorities. And the danger is that if we start interpreting the text as if it were scientific literature. Wait a minute. Scientific literature, it's historical literature. There's a difference. But anyway, or was intending to tell us how God created biological diversity, then we run the risk of missing the central theological messages. This argument, of course, is a non sequitur. The mere fact that one views the text as historical literature, not as some type of figurative manifesto, certainly does not mean that one will miss the main theological points of the text. In reality, the reverse is true. The person who views the early chapters of Genesis as figurative will miss some of the principal teachings of the account. Let us turn to consider this point. Walton's argument for taking Genesis 2 as archetypal literature is based on a simple test. Walton comments, in order to determine whether the treatment of Adam in the text focuses on him primarily as an archetype or as an individual, we can ask a simple question. Is the text describing something that is uniquely true of Adam or is it describing something that is true of all of us? Now that's the test. If only Adam is formed from dust, then it is treating him as a discrete and a unique individual. Well, wait a minute. Only Adam is formed from dust. Okay, if, e if Eve's formation conveys a truth about her that is true of her alone, then it is a history of an individual. Um, well, that's not quite the test you used for Adam. But then, in order to demonstrate that Genesis 2 is not describing the unique creation of Adam and Eve, but is in, in fact describing something that is true of all of us, Walton has to do violence to the actual words of the text. In the midst of an entire chapter that speaks repeatedly of numerous specific actions that the Lord God carried out, 
Walton tells us that verse 7, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, does not mean that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. It means rather that all people are created mortal subject to death. You can just deny the words as they read. He says that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took out one of his ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. The rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. That's quoting Genesis 20, 2, 21 through 22. Does not mean that God created a rib, Eve from a rib that he took from Adam's side. It simply means something that is true of all human beings generally, and that is that, man, that a man's wife is his ally, his other half. So... What you can do is you can say, here's the test. Well, there's evidence here, but that doesn't really mean that there's evidence there. So we'll cut that out. And once we get through cutting it out, it will fit. That's how you make a, a square peg hit in, fit into a round hole. You just cut off the pieces. Um, however, several decisive considerations in Genesis 1 through 3 show that these chapters are rightly understood, not as poetry or allegory or figurative literature, but as historical narrative. Genre of Genesis 1 through 3. Genesis 1 through 3 bears all the markings of Hebrew historical narrative. One common grammatical device, and I'll come back to this, that reflects a historical genre is the Hebrew verbal construction of the Vav consecutive with an imperfect verb. This construction appears frequently in the first three chapters of Genesis. For instance, this device of historical sequence occurs 51 times in Genesis 1 alone. And God said, and God saw etc., etc., etc. Another indicator of prose narratives is the use of the small Hebrew word eth as the sign of the direct object, which doesn't, isn't required in poetry. The early chapters of Genesis actually contain a little indication of figurative language. If the text was not meant to be taken historically and sequentially, why did the biblical author employ narrative devices so freely? Yes, Genesis 1 in particular is highly structured. Elements like the repetition of evening and morning throughout the passage reflect its compositional grid. However, repetitive formulas do not necessarily signify non-historical figurative accounts. For example, the entire book of Genesis is structured according to the repeated formula. This is the book of the generations of, and there's, what, 11 of them there? but that in no way indicates that the entire book is figurative in what it relays to its readers. In fact, the reverse. Genesis 1 has an elevated style, yet it is still historical narrative. C. John Collins perhaps has the best genre definition of Genesis 1 when he calls it exalted prose narrative. And I conclude, as I conclude elsewhere, this description properly reflects the sequence, chronology, and historicity of the account, while at the same time underscoring its exceptional quality. The historical nature of the, gen of the Hebrew creation account underscores the reality that God invented time and history. And the history that God created in Genesis 1 is one that is moving and unfolding. It is a linear history that moves from inception to consummation. The universe had a beginning and it is moving toward an end. This truth distinguishes the biblical creation account from the cosmogonic text of the ancient Near East. The non-Israelite accounts are legendary stories that have no determinable basis in fact or history. They are what can be called mythic narrative, that is, stories that have linear forward movement, but they are simply ahistorical. Now, it's interesting to think about this. The comeback would be, well, the Israelite uh, is a legendary story as well. The deeply historical nature of Genesis 1 through 3 is profoundly important to the entire Bible because these chapters stand at the beginning of the Bible whose overall structure is historical. The Bible shows the great scope of the work of God from the beginning of the time to a final judgment and new heavens and a new earth. The first three chapters of... Boy, that sounds like a great controversy theme, doesn't it? Um, the first three chapters of Genesis do not stand alone in the Bible as isolated example, uh, chapters, but are structurally tied 
to the narrative in Genesis 4 about Adam and Eve, and their children Cain, Abel, and Seth, and to the genealogies of human beings found in Genesis 5, and to the historical record of Genesis 6 through 9 of Noah's family and the flood, and to the historical narrative of Genesis 10 of the nations that descended from Noah's sons, and to the Tower of Babel, and to the descendants of Shem in Genesis 11, and to Abraham and the patriarchs in Genesis 12 through 50. Genesis 1 through 3 does not stand alone, but is closely linked to the rest of the entire historical narrative. The macro structure of the Bible is a historical account of God's actions from beginning to end. If we remove the profoundly historical nature of Genesis 1 through 3, we will remove the historical foundation on which all the remainder of the Bible rests. Context of Genesis 1 through 3. The most basic premise of hermeneutics from the time of the Reformation is that when one faces a difficult text, one must proceed on the assumption that Scripture interprets Scripture. The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it well. The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. I am certain that few would disagree that the early chapters of Genesis are difficult. Well, I would be one of those people that would disagree. The obvious question then is, how does the remainder of Scripture handle the Genesis creation account? I know of no text in the Bible that suggests that Genesis 1 through 3 is a figurative passage or that would counter the basic chronological sequential structure of the account. In fact, whenever the creation texts are referred to in the rest of Scripture, chronology and history predominate. So, for example, Exodus 28 through 11, I've heard that text somewhere, uh, reflect the reality that mankind's earthly seven-day week has a set and solid foundation in God's activity in the creation week. Psalm 104, which reviews the creative work of God at the beginning of time, confirms the sequence and history of the early chapters of Genesis. While it is true that not every jot and tittle of the creation account is dealt with in the rest of the Bible, yet when it is considered, it is not understood as figurative in any way, but as a report of actual historical events. Often those who promote a figurative view of Genesis 1 in particular use Genesis 2.5 as evidence. The claim is that this verse cannot be harmonized with the progression of the week in Genesis 1. This is an important issue and I will deal with it in the next session of this essay. More could be added regarding the sequential and historical nature of the early chapters of Genesis, but space and time do not allow us to go into much greater detail. In any event, Although several authors merely dismiss the Hebrew account as figurative and not historical, some by a mere flick of the wrist, the nature of the text is much more complicated and complex than they suppose. They do not do proper justice to the chrono chronological reality of Genesis 1 through 3 and to the fact that God is the God of history. Surely the intention of the author cannot be merely to theologize and to divorce history from the account. The sequential scheme. For many decades, the question, and that should be bolded, I missed that. Um, for many decades, the question of the relationship between the account of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 and Genesis 2, 4 to 3, 24 has been a dominant issue in, the Old, in Old Testament studies. The liberal higher critics, with few <coughs> exceptions, argue that the two accounts are from different sources and they are therefore not complementary but competing narratives of creation. They are two excerpts from two separate compositions which a later editor arranged consecutively by pure chance. Pure chance? Okay. Others dismiss that claim. Brandeis professor Nam Sarna, for example, simply concludes that chapter 2 is not another creation story. More traditional and conservative commentators take the position that the two texts harmonize and the second narrative is a more detailed expo exposition focused especially on Adam and Eve and events of the sixth day of creation. More recently, John Walton has proposed a third alternative. He says that perhaps the second account might be considered a sequel to the first. The second account is not detailing the sixth day, but identifying a sequel scenario. That is, recounting events that potentially and arguably could have occurred long after the first account. So this is the first six days. God created mankind, I guess. And then this special story comes up. But here are some of the key verses in Genesis 2 that have long been understood to give a more detailed explanation of the creation of Adam and Eve that is just mentioned briefly in Genesis 1. Excuse me. Uh, 
Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creatures. creature. Excuse me. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Making these verses talk about something other than creation of Adam and Eve as the first human beings would provide a convenient solution for theistic evolutionists. This is because if Genesis 2 is a more detailed explanation of the creation events of Genesis 1, as Christians have historically held, then the statements form man of the dust of the ground and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman simply cannot be reconciled with the theistic evolution view that Adam and Eve were born from previously existing human beings. So Walton's sequential scheme has weighty consequences for the issue of the origin of humanity in scripture. Walton recognizes the significance of this when, after proposing his sequel scenario, he goes on to say, in such a case, Adam and Eve would not necessarily be envisioned as the first human beings, but would be elect individuals drawn out of the human population and given a particular representative role in sacred space. If, as Walton suggests, Genesis 2 through 3 is not representing Adam and Eve as the first humans created, then the issue of human origins is thrown wide open. <coughs> Walton himself recognizes this reality when he comments on the idea that Adam and Eve were not the first humans. If the Bible makes no such claims, then the Bible will not stand opposed to any view that science might offer. For example, evolutionary models that are popul population genetics, as long as God is not eliminated from the picture. Okay. In other words, Walton is proposing that God created humanity as a species in Genesis 1. But at a later time or stage, he chose Adam and Eve out of the human population to serve as an archetype of humankind. This allows Walton to affirm that he believes that Adam and Eve, in Adam and Eve as historical personages. However, he also contends that perhaps they were not the first humans, nor were they the parents of the entire human species. These conclusions certainly make his position controversial. But Walton's proposal faces several decisive objections. Clear indicators of historical narrative in Genesis 2. Well, on Walton's proposal, key portions of Genesis 2 must be understood not as straightforward narrative history, but as some kind of poetic or figurative descriptions of God's activity. For example, there are explicit statements about God forming Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground and making Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side. But in Walton's view, these have become part of the description of the time, perhaps tens of thousands of years after human beings first appeared on the earth, when individuals whom the Bible designates as Adam and Eve are chosen by God as representative priests in sacred time. This means that if we follow Walton's view, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground does not really mean that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and the rib that the Lord... God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man does not mean that the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman. Several factors in Genesis 1 through 2 stand in clear opposition to Walton's position. The two accounts of Genesis 1 through 2 are both of the genre of historical narrative, not poetic or allegorical literature, and they bear the markings of it. See the discussion above. Um, However, uh, although both chapters are presented as historical prose narrative, they are stylistically different. As noted above, Genesis 1 is what C. John Collins appropriately calls exalted prose narrative. It is exceptional narrative that is highly structured with much repetitive material. The text that begins in Genesis 2-4 is also unusual material, but it employs the common historical prose narrative normally used in Old Testament literature. Corresponding to the stylistic differences, the nature of the content of the two accounts is distinct. Whereas Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 provides a broad sweep in its description of the creation of the universe, Genesis 2, 4 and following is a pointed localized record of events in the Garden of Eden. In the opening narrative, God is the sole actor. In the second one, there are other participants working in the story besides God. This latter difference is reflected in the distinct names for God in the two narratives. In Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, the only name for God used in Hebrew is Elohim, uh, translated as God. It appears 36 times in those 34 verses. 
The use of only this name perhaps carries a universal sense for the original audience in which the transcendence of God is being emphasized. But in Genesis 2, 4 through 24, the Hebrew name used for God is Yahweh Elohim, 11 times translated the Lord God. And the addition of Yahweh to Elohim may be for the purpose of defining the universal creator God as none other than the covenant God of Israel, Yahweh. The idea is to see the movement from the general to the particular. The transcendent God of Genesis 1 is the same as the imminent God of Genesis 2. The distinctiveness of the two narratives is also highlighted by the closing words of Genesis 2-4, which read, In the day Yahweh Elohim made the, heaven, the earth and the heavens. This expression echoes the phrase heavens and earth of Genesis 1-1, but the order is reversed. This is probably because the heavens are at the center stage in the opening account as God displays his mighty acts to produce the universe, while the second episode focuses on the earth and in particular the God, Garden of Eden with mankind in it. Such a movement from the general to the particular Hebrew, in Hebrew narrative is a common rhetorical device. For example, we read in Joshua 14, 6 through 14, about the episode of Caleb requesting an inheritance in the land that had been promised to him. At the close of the passage, the text says that Joshua gave Hebron to Caleb, and Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, and the land had rest for more. Later in Joshua 15, 13 through 17, we read the particulars of Caleb's capture of the Hebron region that helped to lead to peace in land. Although this passage occurs later in the text, it is not sequential to 14, 6 through 14, but is homing in on some specifics and particulars of the earlier passage. Genesis 2 through 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. This verse is commonly used by commentators to deny that Genesis 2, 4 and following is a particularization of day 6 of Genesis 1. The reason is simple. The verse provides a different picture of the circumstances at the beginning of day 6. As Meredith Klein comments, verse 5 itself describes a time when the earth was without vegetation. Since according to Genesis 1, 1 through 12, vegetation was created on day 3, then there is a discord between the two accounts. Consequently, some scholars conclude that Genesis 1 is not sequential, but topical. And Genesis 2, by contrast, is the historical chronological account of the creation of mankind, vegetation, and animals, which has implications for the fourth commandment if you go that way. But the incongruity between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, 5 is not as sharp as some commentators would have us believe. First, the text does not say there was no vegetation on the earth at this time. It declares that every plant of the field, esib, is simply had not been sprouted, yitzmach. In, order, in other words, plants were there, but they were, simply had not blossomed or budded. The verb tzamach, to sprout, is not used of the vegetation in Genesis 1, 11 through 12. Second, this verse occurs, refers to only two categories of plant life, not to all vegetation. As We'll come back to this point. As a result, a preferable explanation is that some plant life existed on earth prior to the description of Genesis 2, 5, and therefore this verse is not an insurmountable obstacle to the generalization particularization view. The reason the plants had not sprouted yet is twofold. The Lord had not brought rain and there was no man to cultivate the ground. The negative, Hebrew negative particle ein uh, employed, or ein I guess it is, uh, employed in the last clause of verse 5, there was no man to work the ground, is a particular, a particle of non-existence. The use of this particle indicates that no human beings yet existed and thus argues against a sequential understanding of Genesis 1 through 2, in which mankind was created in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, and then Adam and Eve were elected out of the existing human population to be representatives in the garden. We need to be careful here because while the part Hebrew particle of non-existence can be used to negate the existence of something completely, it can also negate the presence of something in a particular location, 
Th this text, however, does not seem to localize the non-existence of the garden because verse 5 precedes God's planting of a garden in Eden and therefore it is likely it likely refers to the circumstances of the entire earth. There was no man. Genesis 2.7 also affirms the non-sequential nature of Genesis 1 through 2. The text declares that Yahweh formed the man dust from the ground. Verbs of forming often require two accusatives, an object accusative, the thing made, followed by a material accusative, the material from which the thing is made. This signifies that the material composition of the man Adam was dust. The Hebrew for dust is, simply means the dry, frying crumbs of the earth. The man who is placed in the garden did not descend from previous humans, but was formed directly from the material earth. Toledoth formation, formula, pardon me, these are the generations of, that is. The clause, these are the generations of, is a repetitive structure, formula that is a structure, structural device for the entire book of Genesis. It appears 11 times in the book. Many interpreters understand this expression as a caption or heading for the section that is to follow. In fact, this understanding is so prevalent that several translations do not translate the Hebrew phrase as these are the generations of, but as this is the count of, showing it to be a heading for what follows. This is the translation of Genesis 2.4 used in the NIV, the NASB, and several other translations. But John Walton claims that something, sometimes this Toledoth formation formula functions as an introduction to the next sequential time period. He c concludes that Toledoth in Genesis 2.4 is just such an introduction and there it is transitional and conjunctive. The verse, therefore, transitions one narrative to another and the second narrative would be later in, times, in time than the first. Based on this literary analysis, Walton suggests that the text is not making an overt claim that Adam and Eve should be identified as the people of the first account if it presents the second account as sequential to the first. But the evidence that Toledoth serves as a transitional marker between the new two narratives is, in sequence is quite thin. The only instance of the 11 appearances of the formula that Walton cites as bridging the two narratives in this way is Genesis 6-9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. However, a close reading of that verse indicates that it is introductory to a concise genealogy in the next verse. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So it does introduce a genealogy there. Therefore, this verse fits into a pattern in which the formula frequently introduces genealogies in Genesis. But these cases do not require that the following passage is historically sequential to the previous one. Ah, oh, but it could be. And that's what you will be seeing all the way through this. In fact, the preponderance of the usage of total adult formula is disjunction, in indicating that a new topic is being discussed, not that the next material will be a sequence that follows from the previous material. It introduces a new topic in two ways. First, the formula regularly introduces a genealogy in Genesis and elsewhere in the Old Testament. Um, and notice that there's uh, numbers in Ruth and, and First Chronicles as well as Gen uh, Genesis. The, t the term itself, Toledoth, generations, derives from the Hebrew yalad. And it means beginnings, births. The Toledoth formula is therefore a caption or heading of what is to come and not a sequential bridge from what went before. Sometimes totally crazy, like in uh, these are the generations of Edom. And it bears no relationship to the, in fact, no chronological relationship to the previous writings. For several reasons then, Walton's proposal that Genesis 2 reports events long after Genesis 1 is not persuasive as a legitimate interpretation of what is actually in the text. Etiology is methodology. This is number five. One of the ways in which some scholars today view the account of creation is through the lens of etiology. Etiology in Old Testament studies means claiming that a biblical story was written for the purpose of explaining the existence of some features in the known world. We'll come back to this. Even if the explanatory story itself does not record any true historical facts. The etymology of the Greek word etiology indicates that it means simply to give a reason for something. 
the interpretive method of etiology has been practiced in the field of biblical studies for a long time. M.P. Nilsson provides a classic definition of etiological narrative in Greek mythology, a narrative which seeks to explain why something has come to be or why it has become such and such. And you just take that straight into Old Testament studies. Critical Old Testament scholars have commonly used etiology as a means to interpret a biblical text and to define why a certain narrative may have been written. I will first provide a couple of examples from other parts of the Old Testament for clarity. Etiology used to deny the historicity of some Old Testament events. For example, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. The Dead Sea region plays a prominent geographical role in parts of the Abrahamic narratives. This area is barren and largely devoid of flora and fauna. The Dead Sea itself rises 1,300 feet above below sea level. Pardon me, lies that, and its salt concentration is seven times as dense as seawater. And you can float in that stuff, trust me. No fish are able to live in it. Now, according to some biblical commentators, the writers of Genesis sought to explain the saltiness and barrenness of the Dead Sea area in his or their day by spinning a tale about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then, for literary emphasis, the authors added a yarn of Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. Gerhard von Rad comments that it is quite probable that an old etiological motive is present in the strange death of Lot's wife. That is, that a bizarre rock formation was a reason for this narrative. Um, and then Joshua, the con conquest of Ai as an explanation for a pile of rubble. Ai means rubble, a heap of rocks. Another example uh, appears in Joshua, the ruins. Actually, it's probably the better way of saying it. Uh, Joshua 8, 28 through 29, it is what is, can be called a double etiology. At the close of the story of Israel's conquest of the city of Ai, Two monuments are mentioned in the text. The first memorial is the city of Ai itself in its post-destruction state, which is still there, by the way. Um, Israel has burned it down and has become a forever a heap of ruins. Such stories, written by Israelites living in the land of Canaan, were purposefully written to provide justification and explanation for their presence in the land. The second monument at Ai, in addition to the city itself, is a large distinctive pile of stones. This is described as a great heap of stones that the people of Israel placed over the body of Ai's king at the gate of the city. This memorial serves as a warning, and it also remains to this day. Rather than the heap reflecting a prior historical incident, the narrative was invented to give meaning to the heap. Etiology used to deny the events of the creation account. Etiological methodology in biblical studies has also had a recent strong impact on the interpretation of the Hebrew creation account. Notre Dame professor Joseph Blenkinsop, in his major work on the Pentateuch, makes a case that a parallel exists between Adam and Eve in the garden and the history of Israel as a nation. He claims that the story of Adam and Eve was not intended to recount actual historical events, but was created sometime after Israel's exile after 586 BC as an ideological explanation for the exile. Blenkinsop's conclusion is clear and pointed. One would therefore think that the pattern of events in the history has generated a reflective recapitulation, recasting the national experience in universal terms by the learned use of familiar mythic themes and structures and placing it at the beginning as a foreshadowing of what was to follow. Peter Enns uh, adopts this kind of interpretation. According to Enns, if the Adam story is not about absolute human origins, then the conflict between the Bible and evolution cannot be found there. Whew. Thus, in one fell ideological swoop, the ages long tension between science and the Bible in regard to human origins is solved. Response to ideological interpretation. The assumption in Genesis 2-3 was written after Israel's exile. When one considers the validity of interpretation, it is critical to uncover the various presuppositions that are foundational to the position. No one comes to the biblical material without such presuppositions. At the heart of the theological interpretation of Genesis 2 through 3 is the belief that these chapters were composed after the written history of Israel that appears in the historical literature of Judges through Second Chronicles. <clears throat> 
This is a critical point. The exile of Judah in 586 BC, for example, must have occurred before the writing of Genesis 2 through 3, because according to this view, the content of these two chapters is dependent on the exile already having taken place. Adam's exile from the garden is written as a retroactive reflection of Judah's exile from the promised land. This ideological chronology, however, is a titanic assumption that is far from certain. The assumption of such a late date of composition for Genesis 2 through 3, which is Yahwist, by the way, and which is normally attributed to 1000 BC if you're skeptical, um, has been uh, uh, foundational to higher critical theories of the Old Testament for many decades. Actually, it hasn't. It's contrary to standard critical theory. However, there is little agreement among scholars regarding the specific century in which they think this material was written. The earliest sources, critics, believe that Genesis 2 was writ part of what they call the J or uh, Yehovist, or Yahwist, sources that dated from the time of the United Monarchy, 10th century BC. That's classic. And this position is held by some more recent commentators as well. Others, to the contrary, argue that this postulated J source was a person living in an exilic period, that is, it was written after 586 BC. But, you, so you have to not only believe in historical criticism, but you also have to believe in a minority view and a mostly abandoned view of historical criticism in order to make this work. The reality is that an ideological explanation for the Genesis account of human origins is on a shaky chronological footing. The assumption that all of Israel's history until the exile occurred prior to the composition of Genesis 2 through 3 and that the description of human origins is merely a reflective exile is exactly that, merely an assumption, and a shaky one at that. The assumption that early events were fabricated a second major presupposition of the ideological method is that the connection between the given phenomenon and its explanation must be artificial and non-historical. In other words, a story is fabricated in order to explain, describe, and give meaning to an existing phenomenon. One problem with this presupposition is the reality that in Israel's writing an actual historical event can be the reason for something like the name of a city or location, and thus a genuinely historical tradition might assume an ideological form. Um, and they give the example of Gibeath Ha'arla, um, that's the hill of the foreskins. Um, another example from the book of Joshua is a common expression until this day, or to this day, as in the story of the death of Achan. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, the, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Many critical scholars believe the phrase to this day reflects a non-historical ideology in which the author has formulated a story in order to account for a natural phenomenon. This judgment ignores de Israel's deep resistance to anything mythological. In regard to Genesis 1, the immediately preceding chapter, critical scholars have argued for a long term that the, that the biblical writer demythologized the account. But surely it would be paradoxical if the biblical writer would employ a familiar ancient Near Eastern myth to describe creation and then proceed to demythologize the account. Consequently, the foundational point of the ideological position when it comes to the Hebrew creation account is an unwarranted mythologiz mythologizing of Israel's historical tradition. Adam as an actual historical prototype of Israel. Certainly there are thematic parallels between the history of Israel and the Edenic, Edenic episode of Genesis 2 through 3. But the most natural way to read the material is chronologically and not in a reversal of the sequence of the two events. Adam serves as a genuine historical person who also serves as an archetype or prototype of Israel and not vice versa. Therein lies the great theological lesson. As Adam was exiled from the garden for not obeying God's word, so Israel, a second Adam, is expelled from the land of promise for its failure to keep God's commandments. In other words, history repeats itself in some ways, or at least it echoes. There is, therefore, a need for a true second Adam to come to obey God's word and to secure an inheritance, a true promised land, which is echoed in Hebrews 11, 15 through 16, for the people of God. When understood in this historical sequential framework, then the question of human origins cannot be swept away 
by the mere brushstroke of etiology. Conclusion, as can be seen in these various approaches to the issue of origins and human origins in particular, the landscape in the field of biblical studies has changed dramatically in recent years. In evangelical Old Testament scholarship, especially several scholars who confess to orthodox historic evangelical Christianity, well, sort of, also support evolutionary creation. And uh, mentions the Bio Biologos Foundation, of course, as part of that. The shape of the debate on origins and on human origins in particular will no doubt continue to change. This will happen on both sides of the issue with science and biblical interpretation. Science, of course, is a continuing process and new data and theories will emerge. I further suppose that new interpretations of scripture will appear, but I also think it is likely that the more traditional interpretations will increasingly prevail in the church. At base level, the issue is the same as it has been for more than 150 years. Does one hold to the complete truthfulness of the facts reported for us in Genesis 1 and 2, and especially in the immediate creation of Adam and Eve as the first humans, or not? This is the question that thundered during the time of James, the James Woodrow controversy, and it still thunders today. At least for Presbyterians who affirm the Westminster Standards, and I would hope for countless others who believe the Bible, the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 17, satisfactorily summarizes the correct position. How did God create man? After God had made all other creatures, he created man male and female, formed the body of man from the dust of the ground and the woman from the rib of the man, endued them with living, reasonable, and immortal souls, made them after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it and dominion over the creatures, yet subject to fall. Uh, I worry about that immortal souls, but other than that, I'm happy with that. Now, this is m mostly more of the same as last week with a little variation. Notice that Walton in particular is approving of four different explanations, two from last week, two from this week. Settling on the correct explanation is not so important. What is important is that Genesis 1 and 2 cannot be allowed to be historical. See, if they are historical, then we have to agree with, uh, disagree with science. And we're not going there. My comments from last week are, of course, relevant, but there are a couple of areas of further interest in the last part of this chapter. The idea that God cannot do theophanies is ridiculous. Abraham, Elijah, Moses, and all the prophets experienced theophanies. Adam had been sinless before the Genesis 3 incident, so there's no reason for God not to show his face. Adam could have lived in the presence of a holy God before that. And maybe at this point he runs away in fear because he understands something has changed. Um, and he speaks with God, but does not actually look at him. Uh, remember this text, when no bush of the field was in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had caused it to rain on the land and there is no man to work the ground and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Um, and then God formed man. Uh, there is a reasonable interpretation that the text refers to four evil things that were not yet thorny plants, plants that require a lot of work to produce food, rain, or men working the ground. The documentary hypothesis of the scriptures, by the way, has flow, slowly been falling apart. It was not very coherent to begin with. There was a lot of dispute over who had J and who had E and who had P. Um, for example, Genesis 1 was originally attributed to E, as it was a classic example of E, Elohim. That's why Elohist is called Elohist. Um, but, um, but then it got reassigned to P because it was too perfect and it had to have had a long time of polish before it could have been written. And J was the earlier, uh, which is interesting. Deuteronomy was quoted before Deuteronomy began. Many people don't know that. Uh, in uh, Second Chronicles, the the, uh, the story of of uh, uh, Joash, uh, Joash not killing the 
children of the conspirators, or not Amaziah, I guess. Um, pieces of the priestly code have been found before the exile, which just makes no sense. And so the current theory is that the priestly code was pre-exilic. Well, so much for the idea that you could write uh, an atom as a summary after the exile. Frankly, theistic evolutionists are relying on outdated biblical criticism. Even if you want to accept a critical theory, it's outdated. What strikes me as odd is that they claim to be evangelical. Uh, it is deja vu all over again, and unfortunately this movie did not end well the last time. Now the narrative form in Hebrew has a partial parallel in English, and maybe you'll understand this. This guy walks up to me holding a stone. He says to me, I'm going to kill you. So I says to him, why do you want to kill me? So he throws the stone at me and misses. So the stone goes right through a window, and so the homeowner puts his head out the window and yells, who broke my window? And that is kind of reasonable in colloquial English. It's obviously not uh, polished. But the point of it is you'll notice that all of the verbs are present tense. They are intended to be understood as past tense. Right? Okay. And the so um, kind of is parallel to the word and, uh, w or v, depending on your accent, uh, vav consecutive, wow consecutive, whatever you saw in Hebrew. This is really past tense, but it sounds present. It is narrative, by the way, and not poetry. Nobody would ever do poetry that way. The only thing that is missing is the word order. In Hebrew, it would be and says he, and says God, and and says God, um, in fact, to be literal in translating, or as literal as we can be going from one language to another, and says God, um, there will be light, and there will be light. Yehi or, wa yehi or. That wa changes it to a past tense. It is classic narrative style. Genesis 1 and 2 are clearly narrative prose. Current comments that I am certain that few would disagree that the early chapters of Genesis are difficult. Actually, I would disagree with Current at this one point. The Bible, I think, is clear enough. The problem is that it disagrees with science. It's, a, it's really a clear narrative. I mean, you, you could say well, there's a few little rough edges on it, but that's about as far as you could go. It's really pretty obvious. It's just that it won't go where some people want it to go. But as we saw last week, science was designed not to, disagree, not to agree with the Bible. So why are we surprised that it doesn't? Etiological tales um, are, in the usage that is made of the, in this chapter, are kind of like just those stories. The problem is there are etiologic tales that actually do fit. There was a song called uh, Green Grows the Laurel All Sparkling with Dew, which is popular during the Mexican-American War. Um, and some American soldiers who were captured by the Mexicans sang that in camp. And because the Mexicans were having trouble with green grows, they started calling them gringos. That is an etiological tale. It happens to be true. The QWERTY keyboard, some of you are familiar with that. What in the world is that doing? Well, actually, it was designed, uh, you know, if you're old enough to remember when they had actual typewriters that had actual keys that you had to push down and make something go up and hit. Uh, but nowadays, everybody uses a QWERTY keyboard even though you don't need that kind of action anymore. It's a leftover. It was offset because it was easier for, le uh, for levers on mechanical typewriters. You'll notice that there's just a little bit of, they aren't in straight rows. That's because you had to have those levers offset just a little bit from each other. Uh, vowels all were originally on the first line. They still are, except for A. 
uh, combinations such as TH and ST were separated so that you didn't jam. Uh, when one key was coming back, it would miss the other one coming forward more easily. And that's an ideological story. It happens also to be true. That's where QWERTY came from. Same thing is true about why we've, there's only been one US president that had more than two terms. You wonder about that? Well, actually, the reason why is because George Washington declined a third term. He says two terms is enough. From then on, all presidents until Franklin Roosevelt had only two terms out of respect for Washington. Franklin Roosevelt was president during the run-up to, to World War II, and it was kind of, well, we can't change now. And then in the middle of the war, we can't change now. And then he died. So he was effectively president for life. Interestingly enough, because of the influence of that story, which happens to be true, the country passed a constitutional amendment to codify the previous custom, no more than two terms. And in fact, there's an, even a technical one that says no more than 10 years, even if you assume the presidency because the previous president died. That was put in place after John F. Kennedy. As it was, Lyndon Johnson uh, ran for one term and then quit. Um, he was grandfathered in. Uh, as was Truman, interestingly enough, for the, uh, for the Roosevelt Amendment. The point of it is, ideological stories have power, and they have more power if they are true. Obviously, the, a true ideologic story or is more powerful than a false ideologic story. Nobody's going to do things based on George Washington and the cherry tree, now that we know it's not true. You don't do uh, theological stories based on Santa Claus. It won't work. So the question is, do you want the Bible to be authoritative in this area? It seems like the reason evangelical Christians have trouble should not be that they want the Bible to be less authoritative. Most of them, I think, do. The problem, of course, is that the theistic evolutionists are scared of science. That's really the bottom line. I would also say that um, in a certain sense, old earth creationists are, or old life creationists are scared of science as well. But that's a different issue. Anyway, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Uh, one, one of the most fascinating parts of this uh, presentation to me was, of course, a discussion of Genesis 2, which I believe is a Corian document hypothesis, a different author, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is often stated to be in conflict with Genesis 1, especially the sequence of the origin of the plants. And I was so pleased to see how he followed uh, what I'd heard from Randy Yonker before. Mm -hmm about this story, and I don't know if he referred to Randy Yonker's work or not in this I, paper. I, I referred to the work, although I didn't uh, use the name uh, at the end. I mean, did the author use Randy Yonker? I, uh, I didn't see that in the notes, and I don't think he followed it so closely uh, that, uh, uh, that he actually got it from Yonker. Hmm. However, I, I would say that what that means is that more than one person has seen it sort of independently. Yeah. And that, that means that it's a, a stronger argument. Because that argument is used so often. The two are in conflict with each other. And uh, it doesn't hold up that well uh, in terms of that. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate your evaluation of... Uh, the relationship to science of uh, those who tend to compromise the biblical account. Uh, but there is a lot of data out there that because of the dominance of the paradigms that people have to contend with and we have to contend with, uh, that 
I think would not be so impressive if it weren't the fact that uh, God is excluded out of the picture. And uh, that has created this, this uh, fear of my state, which uh, I think would not exist if you looked at the whole picture. What they, what's interesting to me is what people seem to be the most scared of is that genetic science proves that there, that there were never less than 10,000 people on Earth at one time. Which, of course, unless you had DNA from people back then, is really probably stretching it a bit. And, you know, one of the, thing, one of the interesting things was that the book itself entered into that genetic controversy and showed, I think reasonably, that the the hypothesis that there were that there had to be uh, more than ten thousand people at, at one time, at all times, is actually a uh, is not required by the data. That one can make the case for uh, uh, for four alleles with mutations afterwards for any particular uh, a gene and and with that at that point can pretty much accommodate whatever is out there so are you going to have this happen in 10,000 higher apes all at once well the the thing that i find is fascinating is that the t the one case where there isn't that kind of divergence well, the two cases are mitochondria and the Y chromosome, and those are both acknowledged to point back to, uh, by conventional dating, 200,000 years, uh, which is rather striking if you think about it. And even more striking is the fact that there's good evidence that, that taking actual historical data into account rather than evolutionary theory, uh, that that shrinks down to around 6,000, 6,500 years. In which case, it seems like the biblical story comes out on the better end of that particular discussion. I'm sorry I missed last week, but... I wanted to point out one thing about the whole chapter, and that's that Curid, our author, relies heavily on the preliminary work of Gerhard Hassel, who taught at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. Hassel taught there the same time my father did. In fact, they shared secretaries. They were both in the Old Testament department. And as you know, Hassel unfortunately was killed uh, quite young, age 57, at a Briscoe meeting. And mm -hmm. I think you were probably there at the time. You know, but I think that that's one of, the, one of the few that I actually missed. Uh, I think once I right here, Dr. Roth was there. Yeah. And he was destined to give a paper on the literal nature of the days of creation, which is a foundational paper. So when it comes to Genesis, Hansel paved the way with two landmark studies. One is the idea that Genesis 1 is anti-mythical. Uh, it's a polemic against myth. And if you look in the bibliography here, I think it's around page 843, it cites uh, Hazel as having a 1974 paper in Evangelical Quarterly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he came out very strong because of his doctorate, his doctorate was finished at Vanderbilt a few years before, very strong against the idea that Genesis 1 could be mythical. The very opposite thing is it's attacking ancient Near East mythology, and that's the approach Curit is using. But all, most evangelicals actually acknowledge now the work of Hazel. I don't find them 
debating back and forth. It's kind of, they're inconsistent when they want to go with the mythical route because they will turn around and say, yeah, there's a polemic here against <laughs> some aspects of ancient Near East mythology. So that's one thing that we can uh, find fault with some of these evangelical approaches. Walton actually leans heavy on ancient Near Eastern literature, as you know and we've discussed. The other contribution that Hansel made was on the literal historical nature of the days of creation, 24-hour days. Now, Cura doesn't have to go over that ground again because it's in already fact he covered. doesn't in a way he doesn't dare in this book yeah but it, it's already covered earlier in the book and, and we're going to find we're going to find that mentioned kind of obliquely yeah in it's the chapter after the new testament where it gets yeah theology. It, it raises its head again but uh it they go very easy on that point but that's really the foundation of young earth young life creationism the nature of the days of creation. Yeah. I, I mean, there are other, many other arguments, many other lines of thought, but if you can settle the issue of time, then everything else kind of falls in place. Well, see, this is one of the reasons why I think evolution, although it's the one that creates the most energy and the most noise, is actually not the most important issues. The, the, the important issues are, number one, does God exist? Number two, can you detect God's activity? If you answer those two in the affirmative, and by the way, that's what the whole argument about God of the gaps is. It's a, you can't dare look for God's activity as detectable. That's really what it's about. And the interesting thing is, if you go there, if you, if you accept that God exists and you accept that he can do stuff that you can tell, then you can skip, you can do the origin of life and that kills the non-detectability of God. And you can skip clear over evolution and go straight to uh, the theological question of, you know, what is the relationship of of humankind to Neanderthals and so forth? And if you answer that in the way that um, uh, Contested Bones answers it, then at that point you pretty much have a short age creation for man. And then the only real question is, what do you do with all the other time stuff? And so... At that point, if radiometric dating gets turned around, I, I think the end is in sight for a reasonable argument uh, against the biblical record. Now, you brought up something I wanted to respond to in the affirmation of what you were saying, that genetically, if you use the Y chromosome, if you use mitochondrial DNA, you're not going to go back very far in geological history. Uh, it's very interesting. Back, I think, in the 1970s, maybe 60s, Carl Henry, who was editor of Christianity Today, had two articles in that journal. One was the late Genesis man. The other article was the early Genesis man. And the argument was the early Genesis man would go back maybe 100,000, maybe a little more. And so that was uh, well before DNA became well known for at least dating. And so it's very interesting that evangelicals, many of them were willing to go back maybe 100,000, not more than 200,000. That's back in, the, I think, 1960s or 70s, as I recall. So, um, but once you open that door, it seems like uh, you can go back and back and back and back. So, yeah, that, that becomes the problem, the domino effect. Well, um, you know, it's it's interesting if if you uh, 
like I say, the, the book starts out by just arguing for uh, intelligent design. But once you start getting into the biblical stuff, it's really hard to avoid those questions of uh, uh, the time. And if you give the Bible any weight at all, it's really hard to try to create a scenario where the Bible somehow fits um, a long history. And I think that's really what we're looking at. Anyway, next week we'll look at the New Testament. It gets even more interesting, and I think when we get to the uh, theology, it's going to be really interesting. And then finally, because they stuck it on, I will discuss B.B. Warfield. <laughs>